Uh, so my name's Matt Gross. Um, we are here today to talk about technic uh, technological innovations in retail, and we've got a great panel. Um, uh, just to let you know who I am, I, I run an organization here in Boston called Mobile Monday, uh, and we do a lot of things with, with my tech, so which is the, you know, the organization behind Future M. And I also run a, a little consulting business and, and do a fair amount of work in, in the retail and payment space. Um, so uh, very happy to have all of you here today. Uh, we'll jump in here with a, with a, a quick uh, question intro of our, of our panelists. Um, and to let you know, um, please queue up any questions you have. We're going to mix some Q&A uh, into the session today. Um, so uh, maybe, Ryan, I'm going to start with you. My question for you is, um, before moving into the retail space, uh, you did something with a company called Hedge Interactive. And I'm very curious how somebody moves from uh, hedge funds and startups into the retail world. So I have no business being in retail. I was, a, I was an agency guy that focused on raising money, or I should say packaging, pre-Patriot or uh, Jobs Act, packaging um, great hedge fund opportunities for foreign investors. And the best part about that business was in the middle of the crisis, we were thriving. So we were marketing former proprietary traders out of Wall Street, Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and so on. Ultimately, uh, chance meeting in Newport, Rhode Island, Carolyn Rafalian, and she asked me, along with a friend of mine, Giovanni Ferrosi, he's now the CEO, uh, how to build an e-commerce business. And prior to the hedge fund world, we were doing a little venture and, uh, and had some ad tech overlap. So that's where it started, and here's where it ended. Great. Uh, Drew. So uh, you started your life at Google and now work for a little company named Leaf, uh, which recently brought in $20 million in funding. Uh, how do you like the culture at a startup versus a large company? Uh, I love the startup at Leaf. I love the culture at Leaf and the startup. Um, I spent two years at Google working in uh, analytics and operations, both on the recruiting side as well as in the ad sales side. Um, kind of a chance meeting, a friend of a friend got married in Seattle. Uh, I ran into one of the co-founders of Leaf, he showed me the app. Uh, four months later, I moved from Seattle to Boston. So uh, in terms of culture, uh, I love being involved with everybody from day one, uh, touching all aspects of the business, as well as you know being, I think, on the leading end of the mobile commerce revolution for SMBs, which is where we focus on. Great. Uh, Sarah, so we, we almost worked together. We just figured out within a few months. I was at Ware uh, previously, and, and uh, Sarah joined Ware and, and is now part of the PayPal organization. Um, my question for you is the Shark Tank at PayPal. Star Tank. Uh, the, the Start Tank, rather. The Start <laughs> Tank. So for those of you who don't know, uh, don't PayPal has built an incubator space in the middle of their office downtown. Um, you are an advisor to uh, some of the companies there. Uh, how do you like it? Love it. I mean, I think um, being a former startup ourselves and now having the benefits of, of the resources of a big brand like PayPal, it really makes sense for us to give back to the community. It brings a lot of energy into our office. We now have 22 startups that are incubating over 90 employees from those folks. And, you know, it's really great to, to bring that back and, and to give back to the community and uh, really enjoy working with those folks. A lot of new ideas, a lot of fresh blood. Great. Uh, and, and Mike, actually, my, my question for you is, um, having been in the travel space and come back into the travel space, uh, where do you like to travel? Great, okay, so j just so you all know our panelists, uh, Mike Putnam is uh, Senior Vice President at Kayak and recently uh, came from Rue La La. Um, Sarah is, um, is with PayPal, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Director of Marketing and Sales Strategy at PayPal Media Network. Uh, Drew is uh, Head of Product at Leaf, the mobile point of sale system. And Ryan is VP of Digital Strategy at Alex and Annie. Uh, and with that, I, I wanted to give you all a, a, a quick anecdote to sort of set the stage of what we're talking about today. I went into an Apple store uh, a couple weeks ago. I needed to buy a new charger for my Mac. Um, the salesperson said, uh, I don't need a credit card. Just pull out your iPhone, download the Apple Store app, 
Uh, and then she showed me where to scan on the, on the packaging, the little, little, uh, little code, digital code. Uh, and the whole transaction happened through my iTunes account. So I, I never had to hand her a form of payment and I just walked out of the store, uh, basically having checked myself out with that product. Um, so on that topic, uh, maybe Sarah, you can lead this off because I know PayPal's doing a ton of stuff in that space from Beacons <coughs> on. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on that checkout experience and do you think that's the future? But I think any, um, any experience that really simplifies it for the consumer is, is going to win. Um, simply offering an alternative to swiping a credit card that doesn't make it any easier or faster than swiping a credit card is of no benefit to the consumer. So there's no need for the consumer to make that change. So what we're trying to do at PayPal is either offer conveniences by saving time or saving money at the point of sale to really encourage adoption of a new way to pay. So you get the convenience of leaving your wallet at home, but potentially you might receive an offer in order to pay with PayPal. Or a pilot that we recently did with uh, Jamba Juice out on the West Coast, um, you could order your smoothie ahead of time. You would get to the store and your smoothie would be ready. You wouldn't have to wait in line. And we also use Geofence technology to ensure that they didn't start making the smoothie until you're within close proximity to the store to ensure your smoothie was still cold when you got there to pick it up. So these are kind of experiences that we're trying to create to delight consumers. Um, recently at Money 2020, uh, we announced a couple of new products, PayPal Payment Code and PayPal Beacon. Um, and we're really kind of trying to offer a plethora of different ways for merchants and consumers to connect. So really enabling the consumer to pay anytime, anywhere, any way they would like to. And working with partners such as Leaf and other uh, POS providers to ensure that merchants don't have a huge upheaval of changing existing hardware or existing point of sale systems, we've really adopted a very partner-centric approach to, uh, to try to achieve that ubiquity uh, in the offline world. Uh, and so uh, on the topic of Jamba Juice and quick serve restaurants, Drew, uh, perhaps can, can you comment on that from the point of view of the, you know, the point of sale, the cash register, so to speak? Yeah. The way that Leaf is approaching this is a little bit on the other side of the counter. So uh, Leaf is very much focused on the SMB, on the merchant. And when it comes to mobile wallets, uh, I think there's still a lot that's up for grabs because it's yet to be seen on the SMB level what the what the advantage is there, right? So, you know, people like you know, the things like PayPal, the Beacon, the mobile wallets, Google Wallet, uh, ISIS, NFC, they're all really great things for the consumer, but it's yet to be shown, uh, you know, what that really what value that drives for the SMB. So. Um, in general, you know, Leaf's approach is, you know, similar to uh, what PayPal's looking at. You know, we don't think that merchants want to change their hardware or make a really big uh, investment in hardware. So we have is a, a very cheap tablet, and we're offering a platform to which all the mobile wallets can connect to us. So if PayPal wins, if Google wins, if ISIS wins out in the end, you know, we want to have an option that an SMB can connect to everybody or pick the one that really drives them the most value. Uh, so uh, m mobile wallets is an increasingly competitive space. We have a PayPal representative of, of one mobile wallet here. Um, you have obviously the credit card companies uh, and any number of big contenders who may be getting into the space, everyone from Amazon to Google, uh, well, who are in the space but may be becoming big players in the space. Um, maybe I'll throw this out to any, anyone on the panel, is, is what, you know, three years from now or five years from now, Will there be several mobile wallets where people will simply pull out their cell phones to pay that, that will dominate? And in that environment, will people go out of the house without a credit card? Uh, we're, we're big believers in uh, yes being the answer. Uh, people are, are freaking out still about cutting the cord, and you know, we feel it's a no-brainer. You know, when, when the Roomba came out, people were freaking out. Uh, I, I, still, I still can't... Uh, Imagine why we can't charge our, our cell phones without a cord with kinetic energy and maybe talking in the phone can charge the, the phone itself. Um, but that all said, uh, we're, as a company, we're very forward thinking and even if our customers aren't adopting it, we're certainly open to, uh, to experimenting. And if experiments don't work, we at least have the knowledge to put something into action at some point in the future. So as far as, as, far as mobile, um, wallet, you know, whatever we're going to call it five years from now. I think as long as security is there, and security gets better and better every year, right? Every quarter, I should say. If the security is there, and, or at least we can put the liability on somebody else, uh, we're more than willing to, to build around that ecosystem. And I, I wouldn't venture to say we're building internally. I think it's about leveraging best-in-breed partners, best-in-breed technologies, 
those that have actually done it before where you know, I can eliminate um, not only the creative bias, but I can eliminate all the, the business rules required with doing it the right way. So being a company uh, led by uh, a guy that uh, led United States Central Command in the military, it's, it's a lot of prepping the battlefield. And we've got a, a military-like mentality with a company full of women. We think we're about 90% female. We think we, we just hit 900 employees, or we're coming up with 900 employees, and we're still about 90%. So this is a guy that really talks in code. We're talking, you know, sit rep meetings, which stands for situation report, and you know, Wilco is will comply. But in this case, instead of a general, it's a girl in heels. So um, <laughs> to be able to take these creative, innovative, fashion-forward concepts with the customer's preferences into account, we really feel that we've got to, to build extensions of our team and turn to partner communities like agencies, um, turn to the service providers themselves beyond agencies, and then turn to the people that are actually building the tools. Thanks, glad we asked. Uh, so Rula La, just as an example, they have all the standard credit cards, they have PayPal on their website, uh, just implemented Visa.me earlier this year, and we were also a launch partner for Google Wallet on Android at Google I.O. this year. And I think uh, we're experimenting with lots of those. We expect that people definitely want easier ways to pay. Um, but it's also quite confusing. The last thing you want is sort of a smorgasbord of buttons on your payment page with 20 different options. Uh, and I think that uh, I would fully expect things to shake out. It's like if you look five years ago at all the different mobile software platforms, there were probably 25 of them. And it's essentially narrowed down to three or four. I really expect the same thing to happen with payment networks because there are such strong network effects. And if I had to risk a guess, I think the, the four strongest would be uh, in no particular order, PayPal, Google, Apple, Amazon. Uh, and I think it's the companies that, that are tech companies that have a huge advantage. I think it's very hard for a, a credit card company to compete with uh, a tech company. I think to augment that as well, I mean, PayPal has over 60 million users here in the US. And you know, we talk about mobile wallets, but we don't really see it as, as a mobile wallet. Um, we see it as on, on, on the channel digital wallet. So you know, people are already habituated to using PayPal online, um, somewhat in the mobile space, now in the offline space. And we've kind of built this relationship really engendered around trust and around security. And you know, I think having that ubiquity of consumer adoption already, I mean, I think there was a, a study by Comscore earlier this year showing that PayPal is leagues ahead of the Googles and the Amazons of this world in terms of not only uh, awareness of their wallet offering, but also in terms of usage as well. And I think you know, the fact that we have this reputation, we've been doing this for 14 years in the online space, makes us you know, a natural kind of front runner when you look at um, expanding beyond online. Um, so, site that you agree. <laughs> Uh, Ryan, actually, I, I'm interested from the point of view of Alec, Alex and Annie, um, because you are a retailer, and you also do e-commerce, and you also work with other retailers. Is that correct, As, to resell your product? So we're, we're true multi-channel, correct. Uh, we have 40 stores <sighs> scattered, um, but I'd say a, a good 60% are concentrated in, in New England, um, but still we're in kind of random places like San Francisco and Denver and Palm Beach, uh, we, Saratoga Springs, New York, we kind of follow a, a polo scene there. Uh, 40 of our own stores, maybe 41. They, we, I think we, we, we actually have another military term called transitional operations, uh, what's, which is an advanced team that opens up stores. And the model that they built um, for next year is, you know, they can, if they want, if we want, um, we can open up one store every three days for the entire year. So we also sell online. Uh, online is, um, Last year it was under 20% of our business. The goal is to get it over 20% of business. And then the, the biggest piece of our business uh, at the moment is the wholesale. So selling uh, directly to Bloomingdale's, Nordstrom, uh, maybe Neiman Marcus, Belk, uh, all the way down to the Mon Pa, uh, the gift shops of the world. So about 2,000 of those accounts. And to put it in, in, uh, in terms of dollars, uh, I guess I can say this publicly. Um, we are a private company. Um, 
$80 million uh, last year. Uh, I think it was 14 the year before that. And this year we're tracking for somewhere close to 200. Those are big numbers. For, for two years, yeah, two and a half years. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of, in terms of an omni-channel approach, I, I, I'd be curious what, how, so omni-channel meaning somebody discovers your product through different media, perhaps it could be print, it could be mobile, it could be online, and then uh, either buys online, comes into the store. When you're doing that reseller re arrangement and you have your product in Bloomingdale's, for example, can you actually make a connection with the customer if, if you're not fully in control of that sale? There's, there's an after effect to every transaction. So somebody buys at Bloomingdale's. They're gonna buy, given our brand, they're gonna buy again. We're, we sell single charm bangles. What that means, it's a bracelet. It's got a charm on the bottom. It hangs off the bracelet and people like to stack them. So it's, a, it's an addictive product. As it stands now, we're the fastest growing retailer on the planet. Uh, that, that excludes all the guys going from one store to 10 stores, so mid-size and above. Uh, and we also sell more uh, than all retailers uh, in terms of sales per square foot, uh, with the exception of Apple. And that, I think those are audited numbers as well. So that all said, the, the demand is quite high for the product. The secondary and tertiary purchases do happen on our direct-to-consumer business. When it comes to tracking, yeah, you can, you can take the traditional approach and force product registrations and offer some sort of incentive, and that works, and you can model it out to assume what people are doing in different areas. And yeah, you get data, you get email addresses, you can do the, you know, you can, you can hire a CRM person to give you a number that might make sense, and that number could determine a strategy. It could determine your account strategy in terms of new doors to open, your own doors uh, beyond the account strategy, uh, new marketing dollars, where they go, co-op dollars, uh, but more importantly, I think the, the question you, um, or what you're getting at is can you, and we're at Future M, right? So can we do this digitally? So being a brand that has more demand than supply, we can turn to our partners, we can turn to Bloomingdale's and we can say, hey, you guys are also selling online. Let's turn this into a partnership instead of a buy-sell relationship. So can I get to the point where I've got Bloomingdale's agreeing to pixel, put a little tracking technology on their Alex Nani pages. Non-identifying information, going back to our big spaceship, right? Our, our data management platform that tracks where in the world we're sold. I think you can get there, uh, and it's a question of measuring audiences. So the Venn diagram, Bloomingdale's is a beach ball, the size of a beach ball, and we're the size of, um, uh, I don't know, a baseball. So when you, when you connect those two circles, what's the overlap like, and what's that overlap of Bloomingdale's look like in relation to Nordstrom and Belk and so on. And, and it could get to a point where we're splitting up areas of the country where it makes sense to compete in some cases. Uh, but I, I think that the important thing is that these, these wholesale relationships are evolving into, into data-driven partnerships. Uh, Mike, Mike, can you, from the rural Ala perspective, I'd, I'd be interested in, in your take on this, which is, which is really all e-commerce or, or the vast majority of e-commerce. Um, but I'd, I'd like to hear your take on Omnichannel. Sure. So I think Omnichannel uh, changing very, very quickly. Uh, for Rula La, it's a, for those of you who don't know, it's a flash sale site headquartered in uh, Boston. They sell great merchandise, mainly for women, but also for men, kids, etc. Uh, <clears throat> and they open boutiques that are only open for two days. So uh, I think that the way Rula La has really built uh, Omnichannel is, is still all digital. So they have a website, they have a mobile website, iPad app, iPhone app, uh, not stores. Uh, so I can comment from, from that perspective. And one thing that Rula has seen is that mobile has taken off much faster than anyone expected and tablet has taken off much faster. So for the, for the company, 40% of their revenue is mobile. They expect more than 50% of the revenue to, to be mobile next year. Uh, and that happened extremely quickly. I, I think for Rula La, why did that happen? Uh, it has to do partly with just the nature of the business, that they have these new boutiques that open at 11 o'clock every day, and merchandise sells out quickly. And so people, you know, they want to get in there and, and buy while it's still there. They had a, a very cheeky campaign uh, that said, I did it in the conference room, I did it in the, in the car. And it was very funny because people will shop in the middle of their meeting at 11 o'clock uh, and, and buy things. And so there, uh, you can track, you know, when people are, are doing that. And, and really, their most valuable customers are the ones that use all channels. Uh, and I, I think 
you know, part of the channel is how do you integrate the in-store experience? Uh, I was talking to a friend at Nike, and as it turns out, Nike does not sell through Rula Law, and I, I asked her, you know, why don't you sell through us? Um, and she said, well, we already have a, a, an outlet, outlet mall strategy. And so that, that was quite interesting to hear from them because that's their off-price uh, channel. Um, so there are lots of different ways to reach your customer, and I think the key is, is not how do you want to reach them, but how do they want to reach you? Yeah, I mean, I, I would concur. I mean, I think there was a Comscore study um, that said 67% of consumers start their shopping journey in one channel and end it in another. So it's really kind of key for retailers and merchants to be present across this entire plethora of touch points, both digital and physical, in order to engage the consumer and understand that you know the end point where the purchase takes place is not necessarily the whole story, that there are a number of other um, junctures along the way that have had an influencing factor on that purchase. So. You know, maintaining a holistic strategy um, and deploying campaigns that work across all these channels seamlessly, I think is critical in, in the marketing day and age that we're living in. Uh, I wonder, maybe we can take a moment if there are any questions from the audience to, to do a question or two. Uh, go ahead. Uh, pardon me. Oh, okay. yeah. Sure. <clears throat> I have two questions here. First of all, PayPal. I, I love the idea. I'm a big fan of PayPal with Jamba Juice, and I use it all the time when I go to San Francisco. The, the pain point for me as a consumer is there are so few merchants that's available for prepaying, pre-ordering. Why is that? You know, from your conversation, I'm curious as to where the pain points are. And sure. I mean, I think it's not so much around pain points. Um, it's around kind of creating these experiences that are delightful for consumers. Like we've signed this deal with Discover, we could roll out and gain ubiquity very quickly. But if consumers don't have an amazing experience the first time they use it, they're not going to reuse it. So we have um, been pretty strategic this year in deploying efforts in three main markets, San Francisco, New York, um, and Austin. And if you're in any of those cities and you open up the new version of the PayPal app, you'll see all the merchants nearby on the home screen that are accepting PayPal. And I think you'll be surprised at how many locations that consists of, both from the large merchant all the way down to the sole proprietor and the small business. And a lot of those have order ahead functionality or pay at table functionality in restaurants and those kind of experiences that we're trying to bring across the entire country. We're kind of testing it in those markets. We're seeing what the adoption is like and slowly rolling that out nationally. But um, very much test and learn. You know, there's a lot of um, innovation in payments right now. And so we're trying a lot of different stuff out, seeing what works, seeing what doesn't, and um, taking it where we get traction. Uh, another question from the audience. Sure. I mean, I think um, from, from the PayPal standpoint, when it comes to trying to gain consumer adoption uh, of a new way to pay, the optimal environment in which to do that is environments where the consumer is shopping frequently. So everyday spend category, grocery, um, gas, convenience stores. If you can gain presence there, first and foremost, you're going to get that habituation. So I think you know, long term, yes, we would like to be available for any kind of purchase. But those larger purchases that happen with such little frequency, I don't think would strategically behoove us at this point um, in, in the ramping of that adoption. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anyone else have a thought on that, on, on larger purchases, by buying a car versus you know, buying a pair of shoes or a piece of jewelry? Nobody's thought about it. I mean, I think <laughs> the, the other point as well to make there is like consumers, um, you know, they, when they're spending a large amount of money, they like to use a tried and true method of payment. And, you know, we see it all the time with, with mobile campaigns that we run. It's difficult to stimulate consumers to purchase high ticket items uh, in, in the mobile environment because there's not as much um, 
they don't have as much of a background of doing it. There's, there's no trust there. Uh, using PayPal in that environment has certainly helped accelerate that. Uh, but I think you know you need to get the consumer habituated to that method of payment before they trust it enough to spend ten thousand dollars using it. So so let let's shift into the brick and mortar retail environment because I, I I think that's just an amazing landscape in terms of what technology is opening up. The price points dropping, connectivity, every consumer with a mobile phone. Um, so I guess a, a couple things I'm interested to hear about. Uh, one is indoor location. So I, I've been in the location-based services space. I, I spent many years at MapQuest and then at Ulocate, which became Wear, which became PayPal, eBay. Um, and, and indoor was always like the last frontier. Like how do you map the interior of a store and then how do you actually interact with consumers when they're there? It ties into everything from how they browse the shelves to uh, how they check out uh, or how they pay at the point of sale. Um, and then there are different technologies. There's Bluetooth, there's Wi-Fi, there are different technologies for using uh, lights. A company like Byte Light that puts in a <coughs> light bulb of a particular frequency. There are others that do it by audio and audio beacons. So anyway, big broad question, but I'm just interested to hear what are your thoughts on, on the, you know, the next evolution of the interior of a store? So we've got some stores, uh, we've got some tests. We tested um, a local, uh, local group, Swirl, here, and, uh, and that was a uh, low energy Bluetooth, just a little size of an Oreo. The Does goal, we'll just to clarify, Swirl is a company with a mobile app that also provides little Bluetooth beacons that can be spread throughout a store. Correct. Um, we tested here in our store in Soho, New York. And the data is impressive. The tracking is, is impressive. The, the scale uh, is, is always, and this isn't, I'm not speaking to Swirl, I'm, I'm talking beyond concept because they did certainly prove the concept. Can it scale? So can, can a provider bring me a new audience? And so I'm talking about people that are outside of the store being incentivized to walk in a store. And as a company that doesn't really discount, we don't you know, we don't, we don't slash prices to, you know, to get people to buy. The price point is so low. We've got a $28 average, uh, average unit price, and, um, and our average basket online is, is close to 70 bucks. So when you add it all up, we're low price, but at the same time we compete with Tiffany, believe it or not. Because when you add up the value of the wrist, it, collectively it's, it's the price of a collection on someone's wrist is the price of a Tiffany. So to get people in the store to buy a $28 product is not a big deal. We also have a high touch, meaning we spend a lot of time with the consumer in the store at the point of sale. So 20 minutes plus, and you know, a lot of questions, it's kind of like therapy, you know, what's your, what's your path of life? And you know, we go into you know, one of 3,000 SKUs to start and then an infinite number of combinations. So getting back to the question, to monitor what happens in the store to become better merchandisers, visual merchandisers. Yeah, I think it's important. Um, testing with um, Prism Skylabs is, is another group we're testing with right now, and they actually put, uh, they put technology into your existing security cameras to do heat mapping within the store itself. Uh, but where it's going, you know, everybody's talking about uh, all the different buzzwords. Um, you know, iBeacon and, and NFC and uh, you know, Bluetooth, low energy. We're going to test everything, and ultimately there'll be you know one or two players that determine the right path, and everybody will be forced to evolve. But we we feel, regardless of the popularity, we've got to use our network of forty stores to learn, and maybe more next year. Uh, Drew, can you can you address that question just from the point of view of the point of sale and what <laughs> consumers might. You know, what, that, what that merchant needs to know about the consumer when they approach the point of sale. Yeah, you know, in the SMB space, it's a little bit different because you know, our merchants don't have a lot of money to put in these complex systems. You know, they don't have the time nor the resource to go out and you know, test to the degree that you know, someone like Alex and Ani will. Um, you know, when it comes to location services and things like that, it's really about, you know, still about, as we spoke earlier, facilitate, facilitating the payment as quickly as possible, right? So you have people like Square, you have people like Groupon to where when you're walking by the store, you know, you get an alert for a discount, you walk in there and you do it, and then it's, you know, about instead of having to pull out my phone, you know who I am, you confirm my face and I pay. 
right? Um, you know, I'm very interested in the Bluetooth LE as well. It seems like a little more seamless way to do it, um, and you know, it uh, doesn't run on the battery as much, and it's going to, you know, we think uh, even make that facilitation of payment even easier. Um, on the point of sale, it's interesting to see, in the end for SMBs and the big guys as well, it's really about like, how do I not change my point of sale and still be able to take advantage of all these new things, right? So it's interesting with the, uh, with the new PayPal code and some of the other things that people are doing to, um, you know, the minimum amount of investment to get the most out of the return with what's going on in the store. We, we were a small business two years ago, two and a half years ago. Uh, I, I think we did a lot of things early on to, you know, to recognize the, the path. Uh, so our most valuable customer, as I mentioned, was the high touch customer in the point of sale that spent a lot of time learning compared against the, you know, the two minutes they spent online deciding whether to like us for the first time or buy or repeat purchase. So when it comes to modeling that journey, I think there are some very cheap um, methods of, of, of doing um, the tracking component at least. So what I'll call, um, you know, just the, the journey of in-store to online, um, kind of the poor man's attribution. So when you sell something at, at your, your cash stack, you're either going to give them a receipt or email a receipt or use Square or whatever else and send a receipt. Being able to model that against online transactions is, is critical. So just from a basic fundamental CRM perspective, I think it should be done. But you're able to, if you're able to measure online or offline to online, you're also able to, to look at some, some very fundamental uh, direct marketing practices where you're, you're looking at you know, variable costs on postal mail or postage. Uh, in, in addition, I think it's important to, to discuss uh, briefly the, the, um, the money that you put into online as it relates to offline. When we scatter digital dollars all over the world, um, we're hoping that we're going to have that reverse effect at the, the, the point of sale as well. So we're actually removing credit from traditional marketing dollars, which really brings your CMO a little closer to your, your CTO or your CIO or your if you're forward thinking, your chief digital officer. So, you know, breaking down all these, these barriers of communication and getting to the point where you're looking at the customer in, in a unified view is, yeah, it's something we all discuss. I think omnichannel was the biggest word of last year, but I'm getting sick of it. Uh, it's pretty basic stuff. So if you're a small business and you've got a couple stores, it can be done if you're sending e-receipts through your POS. And it's as simple as, you know, asking the question, what's your email address? 98% of people, they don't even think anything of it. So send them their e-receipt, and then maybe you can upgrade from there as a small business. Maybe you take your, your, um, your, your ESP to a higher level. Maybe you're looking at you know, personalized send times based on you know, that little beacon that fires when they get their e-receipt. And then maybe when you, when you grow up a little bit and you can afford to do it, you start connecting your system. So someone that gets the e-receipt on the way out of a store on their iPhone, they're gonna return to their apartment or their house, and they're gonna connect that device to their Wi-Fi automatically. So assume that at some point in the future you're going to be able to connect something as simple as an e-receipt to activities in people's homes. And it gets a little creepy, but think of that as the future, and, and that's what we do. Uh, Sarah, on the topic of indoor location, PayPal's very much in that space. What, what are your thoughts? Sure. Uh, so recently we announced uh, Beacon, which will be piloted next year. Um, and Beacon is using Bluetooth low energy, so it doesn't drain the phone, um, very straightforward to use, very low adoption cost for the merchant. And that will not only enable you to, as a consumer, opt to automatically check in with a merchant, so it's an optional permission-based check-in, but it will detect when I walk into that store, it can check me in, I can go ahead and authorize a payment with just a click of a button. And then within that store, I can also get enhanced experiences that could be incredibly personalized, so based on potentially what I've purchased in the past, there could be recommendations for me of new items in the store. Or I could look at a particular item and get ratings and reviews information all through my phone. So really kind of not just a, a method of delivering payments, but a method of delivering a very personalized, enhanced in-store shopping experience um, is what we're endeavoring to facilitate with the Beacon Code. And we're opening that up for developers. So if anybody in the room is a developer and wants to play with that code, um, check out our site, and that will be available next year. Can I just say, the, um, your guys, your, I guess it's the eBay Innovation Lab. Mm -hmm. 
We did a tour in New York. Yeah. There's also one in San Francisco. It, we have a mini one in Boston as well. Do you? It's, it's, if like if anybody it has an opportunity to check it out, it's pretty incredible. Even the eBay now. So we're getting a tour. It's, we're sitting in a living room and tea commerce popped up on television commerce. So order it, pops up on the device. And yeah. before the end of the tour, we actually had Alex Nani delivered to us in, in the Innovation Lab, which is cool. Yeah. So that was the uh, New York and San Fran, right? New York, San Fran, and, and a small one in Boston, which does actually include the eBay now in Boston too? And, and the tea commerce. Same day delivery? Uh, same day delivery. Awesome. Good to know. So uh, moving on to mobile apps. Um, Swirl came up in discussion. Uh, third party app, consumers have to download that app and then use it to go into the store. Um, how does that compare with a either retailer or brand having their own mobile app? Uh, obviously, in the case of Rulala, um, mobile app very central drives sales directly. Um, brick and mortar retailers, is, is that the case? Should they have mobile apps? Should, is that where their focus should be? Um, or should they be partnering up with, with uh, companies that have their own consumer offering? I think often it's a trade-off choice uh, between web and app. And so all these, all the retailers, all the stores, they have websites. <clears throat> Many of them have mobile websites or responsive sites. And they're asking that question exactly, should I build an app? And I think uh, I've heard a rule of thumb that I thought was a good one, which is if your customer buys from you more than five times a year, yes, have an app. If they don't, don't. Um, and I think it has to do with frequency of use. Uh, and uh, you know, because an app, I, I think another interesting statistic I heard was the average consumer has only 40 apps on their phone. And uh, people sort of get app fatigue after they download a certain number of them. They stop looking at the app store. They delete ones that they don't use on a weekly or monthly basis. So if you don't have that kind of frequency, it's unlikely that, that people will use it. There, there was an earlier session on mobile gaming. Um, and that's something that I hear come up quite frequently, actually, with, with brands that perhaps do find it harder to engage with consumers on their phone, is build a mobile game and integrate that into your app. Uh, what are people's thoughts? So there's a lot of different types of people that interact with us as a brand. So you've got your, uh, you guys are in Boston now, so if you go to a, a Patriots game, you'll see us on the outfield, you'll see us, um, you'll see us on the cheerleaders. And in, in measuring the value of these, what we call the affinity relationships, uh, those are people that are discovering Alex Downey for the first time. And they're Patriots fans. So we also have people that discover us because they, um, they're on vacation in Disney and we actually have a partnership with Disney where we sell the, the charms, the Disney charms uh, in the park in, in Disney World. So two radically different types of consumers. In the middle, we've got a core audience that's very into sort of symbolic, spiritual, astrology. And we've got everything under the sun, but that's a, that's a pretty cool segment for us because they're very loyal and they come to us because we're authentic and you know, we make our stuff in America and we're, we're eco-friendly. So to be able to offer one experience that's applicable to just those three examples is next to impossible. Now, that said, I think there are some uh, segments uh, within the, those audiences and then the, you know, the expanded audiences where you know, a dedicated tool that allows us to just drive demand can make sense from a content perspective. So I'll, I'll Mention again the you know the whole astrology type uh, of segment. So these are people that they're into everything you feed them, particularly if it's authentic, and they can see through it if it's not authentic. So to be able to provide some sort of gaming experience, or even you know going back to the app to create some sort of um, you know charmed alarm was a concept we threw around an alarm clock every morning, uh, well like that plays every morning and tells you your your um, your horoscope, but not from like a, a feed perspective from like NBC. Universal, I think it's through the largest for horoscope feeds. This is something that, you know, Carolyn, our, our designer and founder, would, would write in collaboration with some of our, and we actually have, you know, spiritual advisors within the company, and, and uh, we've got a shaman and a life coach and numerologist and stuff. So I think if you're able to build things that appeal to those segments, you need to first identify the segments, measure the segments, and own the data to be able to, to determine when those particular audiences come back. And once you get to that point, then you're able to build something that makes sense from, um, from
from feeding uh, your, your content machine, but also um, tracking you know, the sharing of that information, so adoption within that horoscope community. That could potentially lead to new sales for us. And to do it, yeah, we need to make sense of it. It needs to make financial sense. But we don't want to alienate, you know, we don't want to have the, you know, the Patriots fan think we're you know, just a bunch of, bunch of people that are you know, blessing our crystals that are embedded within our desks at work, which we are. The astrology play is an interesting one. I hadn't heard that one before. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, let's do another question from the audience. Go ahead. Uh, my question relates to the power um, between the discovery mechanism and the, in particular, um, uh, brick and mortar uh, oral, uh, or oral uh, retail. Um, have you seen already how Amazon and, and the, the, the showrooming uh, element and how Apple has commoditized apps? So the, so the question is whether showroom, the practice of showrooming, right, where, where Best Buy, for example, somebody walks in, they see a product they want, and then they buy it online through Amazon? Mm -hmm. you're, you're asked? Uh, Even if they buy it through the, through the, through the, as a specific location, the power, the, 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 the power that the product has, the power that the Okay, so right, the balance of power between the discovery, the store in which they discover the product, and then they convert to actually buying it and where that power resides. Uh, does somebody want to answer? Uh, just briefly, it, it'll always be there. You know, we're always, any, any multi-channel retailer or brand is gonna compete with multiple channels if you've got a direct -to consumer business. So, you know, for us, if someone's in a store, um, you know, price shopping is, is, is the most common use uh, of, of busting out your mobile device and figuring out what things cost. Uh, we're, we're not gonna allow people to sell us at a different price. It's just something we always do. We, as I mentioned, we have such a low price point. When it comes to um, you know, being able to, to, to play it by margin, meaning you know, we do want the direct-to-consumer business, but we also don't wanna hurt our relationship with you know, the Bloomingdale's of the world. Now, Amazon is a different story because you know, right now they, they, are, uh, they actually fulfill for us will change the relationship at some point in the future where they fulfill some, but we've got a, a deep integration to fulfill orders placed on Amazon, though you know, we don't get the data. So we have to look at it from a margin perspective. Now, something as simple as you know, somebody typing in the name, if it's a core market and I've got multiple uh, wholesale accounts bidding on Alex Zani terms, nobody's gonna beat me, it's impossible. It doesn't make financial sense for them. And I, I think we're getting to the point where we can, you know, we can, we can um, work out those relationships where it is, a, as I mentioned earlier, a partnership of win-win. But it, it's, all, it's all assumed uh, with what it is that we do from a digital marketing perspective. So you've got the paid side, and you've also got the ability to just pile content on, on top of uh, if they're searching from their device. If you've got a strong SEO strategy, strong content marketing strategy, there's a good chance that you're gonna beat uh, a lot of these, um, these opportunities from third-party sites, particularly if those sites don't sell you for extended periods of time, like, uh, like Ideally or, uh, or Rulala. Two hours, was it? Two days? Rulala? Two days, flash sales? Uh, about, yeah. no. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably have a permanent presence if we do a deal. Have we done a deal? Do you know? Okay. Is it a permanent presence? <laughs> Good to know. Uh, on, on the topic of showrooming, Sarah, can you speak to, you, you, you guys actually have an app, which is a price shopping app. Sure, uh, so eBay has an app called Red Laser, which is um, one of the leading shopping and, and scanning apps. And um, you know, I think a lot of retailers are, are nervous about, or ha were nervous about showrooming. I think Target um, got very concerned about it a couple of years ago, and then I read recently that they've completely pivoted um, on their thinking around this, because ultimately, no matter how much the retailer doesn't like it, the consumer's gonna do it. It's, it's something the consumer wants to do, they're going to do, and you know, retailers just needed to understand a way to embrace it. So I think what you're seeing like Target and Best Buy do today is to create such a great experience through um, their own in-store 
um, app experience that the, the consumer is delighted by that and also price matching has become you know, a key element within this. I know Staples are doing it this season, Best Buy did it last season. Um, so within Red Laser, one of the things that my team sells is sponsorships within Red Laser. So if a consumer scans an electronics product, they're going to see a Best Buy ad and within that Best Buy ad, they're going to see the price match guarantee. So they're going to know that the best place that they could possibly get the, the lowest possible price on this is going to be at Best Buy. So through, um, through apps such as Red Laser, yes, it does encourage this behavior, but then we also, through advertising and sponsorships, give retailers and advertisers a chance to take control of the situation themselves. Anyone else on that topic? Oh, let's do another question. Maybe somebody in the back. No? Another question from the front. Now, um, how should offline retailers think about offline attribution, ability to put ads online, and ability to track those uh, ads and their effectiveness offline? That's a really good uh, question. Um, and I think that the, the easy answer to that is you have to capture some kind of identity at the point of sale to be able to do that. So if you're a retailer like a CVS and you have a loyalty card that has high penetration within your customer base, you're getting some kind of identity when somebody's taking an action at the point of sale. So theoretically, you can, through third party providers such as Axiom or through um, hashing uh, or any kind of encryption of identity, match that back with an advertising campaign uh, through publisher data, you are able to see what impact an awareness or an offer campaign had at the point of sale. Obviously with offers it's easier if you're delivering an offer to somebody and they're scanning something at the point of sale, coupons, really easy way to close that loop, but through identity-based data matching it is possible to do it um, with just an awareness branding campaign as well. I think, you know, we're taking some, some pretty deep journeys into the, you know, the vendors um, specializing in offline, so I, I think first it starts with online. If you're, if you're building a, you know, an ecosystem to, to measure all of your digital efforts, search, social, display top, display bottom, you know, the bottom's becoming quite monetized. So when you get to that point, you know, that's when you start to, to look at online uh, and offline together. So you know, for us, I, I keep going back to you know, our backyard. This is, um, you know, we're, we're in Cranston, Rhode Island, and, and we're big Boston sports fans. I live in New York, but I'm a Phillies fan. When I look at, uh, as a marketer, um, not that I handle this side of the business, but you know, looking at the amount we put into you know, the Boston Red Sox sponsorship and the Patriots and the Celtics and the Bruins. I think every, every time the Bruins are announced, I think it's now presented by Alan Tanani. Uh, measuring value there is extremely difficult when it comes to the transaction level. Whether it's you know, one of our partners selling us, uh, us on our dot com or in one of our stores. So it's, it's not just you know, put money in and, and see what happens on, on your, with your physical business. There's a lot of testing involved. But I think you know, one of the biggest areas um, within ad tech where firms are still fairly independent, you're, you're looking at these providers, these attribution management companies, and those that we feel uh, at this stage uh, that are excelling in offline, Adometry comes to mind down in Austin, and, uh, and Visual IQ. I think that the two of them are, um, are out there when it comes to offline, not only measurement, uh, to, to the earlier point, um, but measurement of spend. So something as simple as uploading um, you know, game, game data in the stadium, in, in Gillette Stadium. You know, geofence the whole thing and, you know, how many people jump on Alex Anani for the first time on their device. We don't know that. But, you know, there's a model. There's, it's part of a formula. And I think it's, it's one of the most rapidly maturing subsets of this, this crazy world we call ad tech. And, and what are the privacy and security implications of, of all of this, right? I, I, it, Consumers have always been tracked. Um, we all are aware of it, and our credit card information gets processed and so forth. But now, with the capabilities of, of your mobile phone, I it just recently spoke to a company that just tracks your Wi-Fi MAC address of every phone that goes in and out of a building, so it can measure the foot traffic. Um, tremendously valuable in terms of gathering content, building a big data set uh, for companies to analyze and, and target their marketing and so forth. But um, you know, at, at the same time, consumers are being tracked. How, how do people feel about that? You know, um, the way that we look at it is, um, you know, we take security very, very seriously, right? So, you know, tokenized credit cards, lots of interesting things like that. Um, you know, I think uh, co consumers are just going to, you know, 
security is a foundation, right? Uh, we can look at it in the opposite way, which is you know people will be more willing to provide this type of information if they get something out of it, right? So if I'm giving you my email or I'm giving you some kind of identifying information, like what am I getting out, right? So uh, I'm willing to let you track me, walk around the store. I'm willing to you know give you my personal information, store my credit card on your app if that means that next time I walk in I get a discount. Or you know we have restaurants too where you know a customer comes in and orders a California Pinot the next time he walks in. You know, we have a new Pinot, we offer it to them, and that's a very, you know, compelling reason to why you might be offering this information. So uh, we kind of think is, you know, the more that you're willing to give back to the consumer, the more trustful uh, they'll be giving you that information. Uh, that's what general counsel is for. <laughs> we're, we're um, you know, we work closely with the National Retail Federation, particularly shop.org, and, uh, and, and we're pretty well aligned. Uh, this country needs retail to thrive. And, and sometimes, you know, there's a, a small sacrifice to pay at the consumer level. As long as the consumer is given the ability to, uh, to choose, uh, to some extent, not to participate. And I think that's where, that's where DC is going with it. Uh, so, you know, just, as, just look at, you know, retargeting. So even, even multi-channel retargeting. So, you know, we use, um, so Pixability is a great company uh, out of MIT here in Boston. So imagine us targeting, we've got this great uh, Zodiac video pre-roll ad that, that goes out to somebody that's actually looking for Zodiac stuff. And maybe they come to the site and they look at you know, their, their horoscope or their, their uh, birthstone or the Zodiac sign, and then they leave and they, you know, a couple days later they're, you know, they're, uh, they're on CNN and they see that, that ad pop up or they're on Facebook and they see, you know, they, they see the Alex Nani, you know, their exact Zodiac sign pop up. Now that's, that's an issue for some people but it's extremely valuable to us. So to be able to give that one consumer the opportunity at, from the brand side or from the advertising side to, to say, no, you can't track me, or start it at the browser level, which is what you're seeing right now. You know, that, that, that big number we're seeing um, increase uh, every month that, um, you know, in your Google Analytics or your, or your Omnisher, your site catalyst of, of location not known, you know, incognito. So put, put the power back in the hands of the consumer and those that, that are comfortable with it might jump back in and say, you know what, I missed my personalized offers. But I think we just have to be careful uh, about how granular we're getting with tracking. It's a little easier for us because our customers think it's a sign from God when these very specific products are appearing everywhere, particularly with our affinity business. That's, so that's the Yankees fan. That's a whole other level, by the way. <laughs> And, and charity as well, our, our, our charity divide, supporters also. Divide marketing. I, I think. Well, <laughs> we, we've, we've said publicly we, we feel we stand somewhere between hospitals and God, and we've said that very publicly. And that really speaks to our, our charity division. I mean that with all sincerity. A lot of people come to us, they discover us because we've got the, you know, the stand up to cancer bangle or uh, you know, the army charm um, for, the, for the army wife that has someone overseas, and they, and they look down and they have some sort of emotional connection. Uh, but, but I'd say particularly to our charity division, Charity by Design. Uh, so we're very sensitive to those issues, and uh, I do stand by that statement that Giovanni does make between hospitals and God. All right, I don't know how to respond to that. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it, leave it sitting out there. Um, well, let's see, to, to kind of close things out here, let's talk a little bit about new hardware and the next generation of things that, that will guide the in-store experience. So there is a group of people in this room and this morning uh, showing off their Google Glasses and showing various videos and examples of things you could do. Uh, one of those is, is shopping in a retail environment. There's actually a local company called Parworks that does 3D image recognition. They'll map out an entire store and you can just snap a picture with Google Glass and it can overlay information about that. Um, what is a, I, I'll, I'll ask each one of you, uh, maybe you can just say one comment on, on what you think is the next big thing. Talking about hardware, I think there's a, a significant uh, round of innovation going on with the latest set of mobile phones coming out from Apple and Google in that they have uh, separate chips for sensors and uh, that's allowing all sorts of new capabilities like geofencing in a battery efficient way and all sorts of new capabilities that are opening up to developers. So uh, these new phones have more capabilities for tracking all sorts of things. I don't think we've even seen how people are gonna start to use those yet. Uh, I know that's maybe not what you were driving at, but the phones themselves, I think, are gonna continue to be a, a huge hub for this type of innovation moving forward. 
and I think any connected device that gains consumer adoption is obviously going to be key in terms of driving the future of, of commerce and, and payments and shopping. And you know, PayPal's stance continues to be that we want to remain device agnostic and, and be available anytime, anywhere, anyway. Yeah, I'd agree. I think you know the future of it is just about the platforms, right? So companies like Leap and other companies are you know saying or Google Glass are saying you know here is our product, you know go do something cool with it, and it's up to the you know the third parties and the people you know like nobody knew we'd be playing Angry Birds on our phone you know seven years ago, so nobody knows what we'll be doing you know shopping on our phones or shopping with our eyes or on other devices five years from now. We like it all. Uh, I, I think adoption, you know, for us, uh, we're we're so applicable to. You know, to, to non-metropolitan, non-cosmopolitan areas that, uh, again, we don't want to alienate somebody by, by shoving technology down their throat in, in every single uh, creative that we put out. Um, I see Google Glass a lot in New York. I, I was on the subway the other day and I saw a guy doing something. I don't know, I don't know what he was doing, but he ran into the subway pole. So it's and it's kind of it's it's got that comical effect uh, in in the city. But you know we're we're big believers and you know we're attempting to you know to work with with partners um, you know to to be as innovative as possible, including you know the option of uh, of, of creating an innovation lab just so we can test uh, these 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 great new pieces of hardware, particularly wearables wearable technology. Great, I think we are out of time. Uh, well, thank you everybody for participating.